we looked up into space and now we invite you to dive down to look into what lies underwater. So we would like to ask Pierre-Yves Cousteau to come up on the stage and share his insights about innovation and sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for having me here. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure and, uh, and an honor. I love Greece. I love to be back here. And I have to say it's a particular honor to be uh, speaking after Mr. Gary Kasparov and to be part of this panel because... Uh, uh, so, I, you know, during my talks I usually say I learned to dive when I was nine years old and that's, you know, that's one of the activities I've done for the longest amount of time. But actually, um, chess is something I've done for a lot longer. Since I was seven years old, my father taught me how to play chess and uh, Mr. Kasparov has been a a role model uh, in many ways, so um, it's really an honor, sorry. Anyways, <clears throat> I'm here to talk to you about innovation and sustainability. And um, this is my father, Jacques Cousteau. I'm sure you guys are familiar with, uh, with his work. A lot of people say, wait, he's your grandfather. No, 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 he's my father. Um, so I'm living proof that scuba diving is really good for your health. And uh, I don't know, are there any scuba divers here in the room? Yeah, I see a few hands, yes. Those are some happy married people. Happily married, I'm sure those are happy, healthy couples. Anyways, um, so that's my sister there, and um, my father uh, took me diving when I was nine years old, and I've been hooked ever since. He uh, invented scuba diving, actually, and paved the way for marine biology, marine ecology, oceanography, uh, revolutionized a lot of these different fields of science by inventing a simple uh, apparatus for his intents and purposes, which was making movies, as you can see, he was doing it with a lot of style. He also invented houses under the sea, saturation diving, proving that humans could live and work underwater for extended periods of time, which opened the way for offshore engineering and the developments that that has brought to society as well. One of his last inventions before he died in 1997 was the turbosail technology, which is a revolutionary hybrid wind propulsion that can save fuel on naval transportation. And I'll get back to that in a little while. But I'm not just my father's son. I've also got my experience that I'm here to share with you today. And I've worked with uh, Berkeley doing genetic biocoding on the island of Morea and ethnopharmacology. I've worked with NASA in the Atacama Desert looking for uh, origins of life uh, in astrobiology, looking for microbial organisms in the driest place on Earth. It rains every 11 years in these places. I've worked for the European Space Agency, uh, coordinating biology experiments that are flown into the International Space Station. I've created Custo Divers, a worldwide network of divers and dive centers united to study and protect marine life. I recently attended INSEAD, a business school, because I realized that conservation alone and good feelings are not enough to get the needle moving as fast as we need it to go if we want to survive um, on this planet. And I created the Environment and Business Club because when I got to INSEAD, I realized these guys don't know anything about sustainability and they don't really care. So, I, I tried to bring that in to raise awareness of the students of INSEAD, who are the future business leaders of the world, to sustainability issues and to how environment and business can be mixed together. Last year, I tried to commercialize the turbosail technology by applying it to bulk carriers and um, uh, uh, tankers. Uh, this technology can save about 15, 20% fuel uh, with the correct wind conditions. It's a 30-year-old technology, and still today, it's the most efficient uh, wind propulsion technology. That, that failed because of the oil price crash in September last year. Uh, of course, the economic incentive to install these kind of technologies suddenly vanished, or at least was pushed back by several years. So now I work for the International Union for Conservation of Nature, um, which is the oldest and largest uh, non-governmental organization for uh, protecting nature. And I work on several topics that range from influencing cultural values in Europe to foster environmental stewardship, to devising new financial products to allow investments in conservation. But my real passion is diving. And uh, sometimes I do it with a little bit of a cosplay thing going on. Um, and I've been very fortunate as a diving instructor to travel the world and to witness a lot of its beauty, a lot of the incredible creatures, the incredible um, 
sites and landscapes that you can get underwater that you can see nowhere else, and I'm happy to share them with you here today. But I quickly realized, okay, this is beautiful, but it's degrading at an alarming pace. How are we going to protect this for the future? So I created Custo Divers five years ago, which is an NGO um, that basically um, unites a community of divers and dive centers to help study and protect marine life through citizen science. That means that we ask people to report their observations, recreational divers, very simple observations, photos, videos, dive logs, and that will help us make a near real-time diagnostic of the health of the ocean in the hopes of acting like an immune system when problems arise. So the methods originally were an underwater slate, they evolved to a post-dive dive log, and now we're moving towards mobile applications, of course. And thanks to the support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, we moved beyond studying the ocean to protecting it by this pilot project in Santorini in Greece where I became a dive instructor, which is close to my heart. Uh, here with the Hellenic Center for Marine Resources, we basically uh, are trying to create a marine protected area. Marine protected areas are very simple. It's a place where you stop fishing, you stop any destructive activity. And by doing that, you let re nature recover. And when nature recovers, there's also spillovers. So suddenly you have fish, but you're not, you're not endangering the, the, the capital. So we did a baseline scientific study of the marine life in, in Santorini. We came up with management plans, um, with the best practices. And most important of all, because this approach is, is, is a bit innovative and different in the sense that it's not a government saying, hey, now you can't fish here, it's finished. We have to do it, it's good for the environment. This is different. We came, we, we came to Santorini, we spoke with the fishermen, we spoke with the dive masters, we spoke with the hotels and restaurants, the scientists, the politicians. We spoke with everyone and tried to build consensus so that the project would come from the bottom up, so that the people would understand that it's in their interest to conserve nature and to create these sanctuaries, um, and that they would th therefore become the champions of it. Thereby stimulating very different values, cultural values, inside the Santorini community than we would have if it had been a top-down approach. And I'll get back to that in a little while. So, right now my work at IUCN uh, involves, as I was mentioning earlier, um, several different things. And one of them, can we please have the video? Is um, this um, Catlin Seaview project on which, of which we are a partner. The Catlin Seaview is a, a very interesting project. You can see this device that's tracked by a, a, an underwater scooter. It's a camera. It has three cameras that shoot very wide angles. So you get a 360 degree photo of um, the underwater environment. And you can check it out online. It's on underwater uh, Google Street View, basically. Um, and so you can do virtual dives. So for all of you who didn't raise your hands about being a diver, you can just you know, open your laptop and go diving that way. Of course, you won't get wet. Okay, you can, I suppose you can do it in the shower, but that, that's a little more complicated. Um, and what's really, th there's a couple of innovative things about this I want to I dwell on a little bit. First off, the camera that's pointing downwards uh, takes pictures of the, the benthos, so of the benthic communities that live on the substrate. And um, they have uh, developed at the Scripps Institute a algorithm in which they process these images so that they can automatically recognize which species are present and they can deduct what is the health of the site. Also, because they're tracked by a scooter, you can cover two kilometers in one hour in one dive. Whereas traditional scientists lay out these transects, as you can see here, and in one hour they can do at best one or two hundred meters. Um, so the scale has changed, and now with this kind of technology we can assess the health of the environment, uh, make baselines much more efficiently, and probably worldwide in a, in a reasonable time frame. I'm not going to put on the whole video because I'm going to have a little bit of a time constraint. But so. Uh, this graph shows the state of uh, different, um, different problems, basically, that, that we've got ourselves in as a species. This is a 2009 graph. I apologize. It's old, uh, but the situation has just gotten worse since. Um, basically, you can see climate change. It's a huge issue right now. It's a hot topic. Everyone's talking about it. Acidification of the ocean, also the nitrogen cycle, and the rate at which we are losing biodiversity, the extinction of species. Um, now, this rate... The current rate of extinction of species is equivalent or even higher than the rate of extinction that we had when the meteorite killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So we are today the meteorite. That's us. And we're having that same impact on, on, on life. So what can we do about it? And why should we do something about it? Um, well, first off, I, I want to, you know, let you think about why we would protect nature. Do we need it? Do we need this guy? Do we need this 
nudibranch? Do we need um, you know, these beautiful coral reefs? Well, one of the values that they provide to us is beauty, of course. When you go on vacation, you go to the mountain, you go to the countryside, you go to the sea, you need nature to feel human. You need nature to regenerate. And that is one of the services that's very hard to quantify that nature provides to us. Now, there are other services that nature, nature provides to us. And this is an example of these services. Uh, this is Posidon Posidonia Oceanica. It's a seagrass. It's endemic to the Mediterranean Sea. You can only find it here. And what it does is basically it takes the CO2 out of the water and stores it in its root mats. And the Hellenic Center for Marine Resources recently uh, released a publication saying that it's estimated that the Mediterranean seagrass has captured 40% of all the CO2 that all the Mediterranean countries have emitted since the Industrial Revolution. So you can imagine the, the, the phenomenal eco ecosystem services that this, is, this plant is providing to us. Another ecosystem service, you may not be aware, you might be aware, but half of the oxygen you're breathing right now is produced by the oceans. We always talk about um, the Amazonian rainforest, that's great, that's half of it, or the forest in general. The other half is in the oceans. It's these guys. They're beautiful too, it just so happens when you look at them under a scanning electron microscope. And they produce half of the, uh, half of the oxygen that you're breathing right now. Another very important ecosystem service that the oceans provide is food. The oceans feed one billion people on our planet. One out of seven humans is fed by the oceans. And we've already lost in the past hundred years 90% of all fish in the oceans because of overfishing. So I can only let you imagine the consequences, the social consequences, the political consequences, the economic consequences of one billion people going without livelihood one day to the next. Although it's not one day to the next, it takes a little, couple of years, of course. But. And you don't even need to imagine. Look what's happening at the borders of Europe. People are coming in, I'm, I'm not going to say this is the only cause for North African immigration to Europe, that would be foolish, but it is definitely an important cause. These North African countries, they've, they've been living on fisheries for millennia. Suddenly, a super trawler comes by, takes all the fish, they have nothing to eat. And, and they don't come back, the fish, because the super trawlers come back. So all these people, all of a sudden, they don't have livelihoods. And they stack up on these little boats and they try to make a living somewhere. Because we've taken everything they've got, basically. So you can see here the social impact, the social consequences of environmental um, actions, environmental inactions. And you can see how the two are linked and how often environmental causes um, are upstream from the social consequences. People protect what they love is a very famous quote from my father. And I think he said it around 1970s or 1980s, probably before I was born. Um, let's look at it a little more in depth. What does that mean, people protect what they love? It, it, it refers to the values. If you look at um, sustainability and... Um, the environment, environmental movements in the 70s and the 80s, they were very passionate. They were all about protecting nature because of our moral duty as a superior species, as a dominant species on this planet. That's not true, we're not the dominant species. We all know that cats are in fact the dominant species. But they don't seem very concerned about the environment, so we're gonna have to leave it up to us. Um, so there is this, this notion of moral obligation to conserve nature. Because we're the dominant species, there's no life anywhere else in the universe for as far as we know. So, you know, are we the environmental stewards of this planet? Do we have a moral duty to conserve life? And today, the debate has shifted a little bit because these environmentalists, although they made a lot of noise in the 70s and 80s, unfortunately, did not get, manage, to, manage to change things as we saw the 1992 Rio summit, the great declarations and everything, nothing changed. So, today, the discussion is looking more because now we're realizing that we're starting to saw the branch on which we're sitting. Now the question isn't about our moral obligation, now the question is our survival, is our well-being. And that touches a lot more people, and touches businesses. Our whole societies, our economies are based on natural capital. Our health is, our well-being is. So now the question is, how do we protect ourselves? How are we gonna achieve this? Well, uh, this is a report by the WWF uh, with uh, the Boston Consulting Group uh, that was um, recently, recently published as well. Very interesting, that shows an attempt of quantifying the ecosystem services, estimating that the, the oceans produce a value of $24 trillion annually, placing them on the seventh spot of, um, of uh, GDPs worldwide between uh, UK and Brazil, if the oceans were a country. And that's it's a very interesting approach to try to quantify, to try to 
incentivize businesses to say, hey, you've got an opportunity here. You know, this is a business opportunity to be sustainable. It's not just charitable. So again, keep in mind the two reasons. Why do we do what we do? Are we doing it for moral obligation? Are we doing it because it's convenient and there's money to be made? Those are two different approaches. And that's what the World Ocean Summit was about as well. Um, just a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in Lisbon where businesses and NGOs came together to discuss blue growth and the future of the oceans. And the World Bank published a very interesting report um, where they said that if we reduce by 50% our fishing efforts, we will increase our profits by 80 billion. Sounds a bit counterintuitive, right? Reduce fishing, more, more money. And this, this graph kind of explains why. Um, the maximum sustainable yield, which you can see in the middle, is basically the most you can catch without harming the species, without harming nature. But the maximum econom economic yield is the maximum you can catch to maximize your profit. So reducing your effort, uh, making your effort more efficient. So there's a huge opportunity here to make money, to, to um, revolutionize management of fisheries worldwide. And that's just one example of the ecosystem services. And this cr leads to the possibility of creating new financial products. And this is what I'm doing now at IUCN, looking at how we can create new financial products to invest in nature so that we can drive the financial industry, drive um, the major industries into conservation, making it in their interests, making money out of protecting nature. Now, I'm almost done, and um, I just, you know, I came here, obviously, I realized that uh, Greece is in a very bad uh, debt situation, and uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say I have a solution to that, but this is a very old trick um, that countries, developing countries, can trade their debt for nature. It's called a debt for, uh, debt for nature swap. It's, a, it's an old instrument that was never used for very large amounts of money. Um, but basically the idea is that the country can trade its debt in exchange for promising to protect, or not just promising, but actually enforcing protection of its natural capital. And um, you can find this on Wikipedia, by the way. Don't, uh, don't need to take a picture with your phone. Um, and basically if we apply this to Greece, I mean, the debt is so big that Greece would become a Jurassic Park, um, <laughs> which, you know, I don't know, actually, that might, not, that might, not, even, that might not even solve the problem. But anyways, just a, just a thought, a nugget, a nugget of thought. I'm almost done here. I just want to finish with these last, couple of, last two slides. First off, I want to say, you know, life on Earth has been present for over 3.8 billion years. It's going to be present for another few billion years. It's gone through several major extinction events. We're creating one now. Um, but we are, no matter how hard we try to destroy life on Earth, we will not manage to exterminate life on Earth. And what we're doing is we're actually jeopardizing our survival on this planet. So if, even if, if we don't manage to make it as a species, well, life on Earth will come back. It'll new species, new forms, recolonize the biosphere, and, um, and life will, will go on. So it's, a, it's important to understand, again, this question of why we protect nature. Why do we do what we do? And there are two fundamentally opposed, but uh, complementary in their actions. Uh, philosophies. One philosophy is we protect nature because of our moral obligation, because of self-transcending values. This is a map of values, by the way, how they correlate between them. That means that if you activate one of these values, the others are also activated. This is used a lot in social psychology, in marketing, in politics. They use this against you, so to speak, to manipulate you um, and to, make you, to sell you more things or to make you agree to, to laws and things like this. Well, today, social sciences and marketing are turning to environmental studies and seeing how we can apply this knowledge that was gained to changing the values of society in order to make us good environmental stewards. So are we doing it out of moral obligation? Are we doing it for our personal financial success? And I think that even if, and I, I hope that we will do it out of our moral obligation, to be honest, and this is just me, it's just my opinion, but that doesn't mean we can't make money doing it. It's just saying, why are we doing it? And that's important. It may not seem important, but it does instill values throughout society. So do we want to keep reinforcing those, those you know, extrinsic, self-centered values, even while conserving nature? Or do we want to try to move to something more humanistic, more universal, while making money? So on that, I thank you for your attention, and um, I wish you a, rest, uh, a good afternoon. <clears throat>